Happy New Year, everybody, and thanks for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Turin, even if not in person. Um, so my talk for today is uh, about, uh, let me say just this, a new uh, research area, which is in between um, descriptive set theory and, uh, um, and the algebraic theory of order groups, which we just started. And what I'm done, what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about is joint work with Adam Clay from University of Manitoba. All right, so let me start from the from the most basic definition of today, which is the one of left orderable group. So in the remainder of the talk of this talk, G will be a always accountable infinite group. And we say that G is left orderable if and only if G admits a strict total order which is left invariant. What do, do I mean by that? I mean that if we are given any two elements of the group G and H, and we have that G is less than H, then the order is respected if you multiply on the left by any element of the group. Uh, of course, this uh, this comes to the dual notion of right or the right durability, and we say that a group is biorderable if and only if it admits a strict total order, which is both left invariant and right invariant. So let's see a few examples just to uh, make it clear what I'm talking about. Uh, first of all, every torsion-free abelian group is left orderable and it's fairly easy to define um, left orders on such groups. Uh, for example, if we're given um, a, direct, a finite direct product of Z or a finite direct product of Q, we can just take the lexicographic order and that's gonna be left order. And, and that's gonna be a left order. Um, other example, examples are non-abelian free groups. Uh, it is actually not so easy to define left orders on these groups, uh, but there are plenty, continue many, and uh, such groups are also biorderable. So not only there are left orders, but there are also biorders. And the first construction is due to Magnus. From the from the sixties. Uh, other examples are from geometry, and this is why recently this subject um, received the the um, interest from many people in geometry, topology, and dynamics. Uh, so other examples are fundamental groups of closed surfaces. And again, the proof of for their ability is due to Magnus. But to discuss a very concrete example, just consider the fundamental group of the Klein bottle. So this is a this is a very interesting example. First of all, it is left orderable. Secondly, uh, it is not by orderable. And the third, I may mention this example later. Uh, because it is a group with finitely, uh, with a finite number of left order, exactly four. And let me also say uh, that a counterexample of left orderable groups are groups with torsion elements. In fact, it's, it's not hard to see that left orderable always implies torsion free. And the reason is fairly simple. Uh, so if we have a, we, we can just take any positive element, G, uh, by left of the ability, we obtain that G is less than G squared, and so on and so forth. 
So if we start with a non-neutral element and we take its powers, we always end up with something either positive or negative. All right. What I'm going to talk about now is a useful characterization of the property of left order ability, which is, if you like, uh, more set theoretical. Um, so, uh, for a group G, being left orderable is equivalent to the existence of a subset of the group that satisfies the following properties. So, I call the subset P. The first property says that if we have two elements in P, this is a very compact notation, uh, just take little p and little q in p and then the product of q and um, of sorry, of p times q is also an element of p and the second property says that uh, p is disjoint from the set of elements which are the inverses of elements in p and g is partitioned by these two sets and the singleton identity so why this let me just give you the sketch because there's some content in this in this proof so if g uh, is left orderable and less than is a left order on g uh, a set satisfying this property one and two is just given by what is called the positive cone of the order, namely the set of positive elements. It is fairly easy to show that it satisfies one and two, one follows from uh, left invariance, while two uh, follows from the trichotomy law uh, of the order. Now, conversely, if a subset of G, P, satisfies one and two, we can define a left order on G by the following recipe. We can set G less than H, even though if G, uh, G inverse uh, H uh, is in P. So, uh, and this is a um, very natural uh, characterization of left order ball groups that we use later. So let me now uh, make a pause. First of all, are, are, are there any questions? If you guys have any question, you can just stop me and ask. Okay, I wanna have this nice intermezzo with this uh, citation. In these days, the angel of topology and the devil of abstract algebra fight for the soul of each individual mathematical domain. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody, uh, but uh, I think this quote is meaningful because these days, especially in this subject, uh, we can really see this, um, this multiple point of view that get together and, and uh, somehow they fight for the notion of left or the right. Let me say why. So, uh, one of the reasons is that it's very natural to consider the space of left orderings of group G. Uh, so let me set the notation first. Uh, we'll denote by 2 to the G, as usual. Uh, the set of function uh, with value 0 and 1, function over G. And this set can be given the product topology uh, with the product topology, this is a space which is homeomorphic to the Cantor space, so it is a very well-known space for descriptive set theorists. Um, now, by identifying each subset of G with its characteristic function, um, we can view the set of subset of G, which are positive cone, that I will denote by LO of G, as a closed subset of that space. 
And as such, if we look at this subset with the induced topology, what we obtain is a compact Polish space. So it's very natural to define this space of left orderings, and there's a lot of structure that can be described. Uh, so the space has been already studied quite a lot, although for some group it's rather mysterious. Uh, but we have some well-known theorem. Uh, first of all, is a result that was first, I guess, observed by McClary in the 80s, saying that uh, for the non-abelian free group on N generators, here uh, N actually doesn't matter, so N can be two, uh, any natural number, or infinity, uh, okay, since it is on a logic seminar, let me say omega. Um, so if you look at the um, at the space of, of left of left orderings of a non-abelian free 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 group, um, we know that that space has no isolated points. Hence, it's homeomorphic to the Cantor space. Um, moreover, we have a theorem by Linnell that is um, celebrated in the, uh, that is really celebrated these days in this area, um, who show that for every uh, countable left orderable group G, uh, the space of its left orderings is either a discrete space of cardinality 2 to the n, uh, otherwise, it contains a homeomorphic copy of the Cantor space. Uh, so this theorem is all uh, is always presented with a weaker uh, with a weaker statement with a weaker statement, which gives a dichotomy for the cardinality of the space L of G. So the cardinality of L, L of G is either finite or continuous. Um, just to have a few examples, uh, so if if G, the group we are considering, is a torsion-free abelian group of rank 1, like Z, then the cardinality of its space of uh, left orders uh, is uh, uh, 2. Uh, I already said that for the, for the fundamental group of the Klein bottle, there are all only four left orders, and uh, so on and so forth. And also for any n, there is a group whose space of left orderings is exactly two to the n. All right. So, but one of the reasons why this is uh, the space of left orderings is interesting is that we can add some dynamical structure. To it. And when I talk about dynamics, I mean the action of the group. Uh, and this is a central notion in modern research in this area. So the group G itself uh, acts very naturally on its space of left orderings uh, by conjugacy. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, if we're given a left order on G, and uh, an element in G that I call little g, then we can produce uh, another left order by declaring A less than B if and only if the conjugate of A by G is less than the conjugate of B by G. Uh, this can be simplified by left invariance. Uh, but let me also stress that um, this uh, uh, conjugacy action is perhaps even more clear uh, when we consider the positive cone. So the positive cone of the result of the action is, not, is nothing else than the conjugate of the positive cone of the initial order by G. So our notation of positive cones seems to work 
fairly well with this. So why do we bother about this action? So we bother because it's useful. Uh, uh, this is a theorem by Witte Morris, which is, uh, again, very celebrated in this area. Witte Morris proved that every left orderable group, which is amenable, is locally indicable. Now, there are many new words. Um, let me just stress about local indicability because we'll appear later. We say that a group is locally indicable if and only if every non-trivial finitely generated subgroup of G has an infinite cyclic quotient. Or, or in other terms, every non-trivial finitely generated subgroup of G surjects, surjects onto the integers. So an example of a group that is locally indicable without being too, too trivial is the group of rations with dish. Although itself, it does not subject onto the integers. Okay, are there any questions to this point? Okay, so please, if you have any, just, just stop. Um, all right, so let's um, also add more structure. So something that we look into today uh, is uh, um, not only the conjugacy action of G on L of G, but also the Borel equivalence relation, which is generated by G action, by this action. What do I mean by this? I mean the equivalence relation who, whose classes are the G orbits for, the, for, for this action. So we can set, uh, if we have two left orderings, which for us are just positive cones, uh, we can set a P um, equivalent to Q if and only if there is some little g in G such that Q is exactly the conjugate of P by G. All right, so we'll be looking uh, into this today. Uh, so let's give it a name. Uh, I use this notation. If you don't like it, uh, you should complain with myself because, uh, because I chose it. Uh, I just wanted to be consistent with other notation by Kekris in, in his uh, new book on uh, equivalence relation. Uh, so we call this equivalence relation ELO of G. Um, and uh, now let me explain what I mean by Borel. Uh, so we say that an equivalence relation is Borel if it is a Borel subset of, uh, so this is, let me say, this is Borel uh, can actually, uh, I just want to save this slide, uh, E L O G uh, naturally leaves in the product space L of G times itself. So this is Borel if it is a Borel set in this product space. All right. Um, and also, uh, we'll denote the quotient space by this equivalence relation. Uh, so the standard notation should be, of course, L of G modulo E L of G. But for short, uh, we just write modulo G. Um, so this is the corresponding quotient space for the orbits relation with a quotient Borel structure. So what do I mean here? So here we are L of G, which as we already said, is a topological space. 
uh, we have an equivalence relation. So there are equivalence classes. Uh, when we take this quotient space, so here we have one point corresponding to each of the uh, equivalent of the equivalence classes. We say that a subset of the space, of the space of orbit, is Borel if and only if the, its union is Borel in the original space. So let me highlight the portion of space that I'm considering. So, so I just take the union of the equivalence classes that appear in the space. Okay. All right. So hopefully the Borel structure is clear. Um, the quotient Borel structure. And um, so about left order left order balloon groups, there's an interesting monographs of about uh, 100, 150 pages uh, by Deroy, Navas, and Rivas. So these people are mostly interesting in uh, dynamics. And uh, this is a very uh, interesting monograph. If you want to see uh, more application of left orderings outside algebra and group theory, but not in logic, uh, they ask if the quotient space L of G mod G uh, can be non-standard for some left orderable group G. So a Borel space is standard if its Borel structure is generated by some Polish topology. And by a famous theorem by Kuratowski, every uncountable uh, standard Borel spaces are Borel isomorphic. So if you if you are confused with the word standard Borel space, just think about uh, the real numbers with the relevant Borel structure. Okay, so first just notice that uh, this is never the case. So this space is always standard uh, when the group is abelian. So why that? Well, when the group is abelian, the conjugacy action doesn't do anything. Just by, by abelianity, because you can, uh, you can simplify. So um, if we happen to find some, some space uh, for which the corresponding, uh, sorry, some group for which the corresponding quotient space is non-standard, that group has to be non abelian. All right. Any questions about this? Okay, so what, what we do today will be addressing this question and uh, uh, also will give an answer to this question. Wait a minute. Uh, maybe maybe I, I have a I have a question. Why why exactly? How do they arrive to this question? These three: Deroy, Navas, and Rivas. Uh, that's a very <laughs> interesting question because I have no idea how to. Because it it seems I mean, it's it's very specific. I mean, it's like okay, okay, all right. It's just like okay. so. Maybe may, maybe it was just their curiosity. I guess okay. I mean, and also from from what we we will see now will be clear that um, these three uh, amazing mathematicians are very <laughs> expert in their field, uh, but they don't have much familiarity with certainly not with the theory of uh, countable Borel equivalence relations. So you're right; it's it's a very peculiar question if you're not a descriptive set. Set, set theorist. Also, they didn't mention any immediate application of this in in their monograph. So okay. I suspect it was someone else who was the question to them and pointed uh, out this question, uh, and they included it in the in actually the second version of of their book. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And again, if there are other questions or curiosity, uh, those are all welcome. You can just ask. 
Oh, okay. So this seems to be an open question, not for too long, but for quite a while. Um, another intermezzo. This is a this is a quote by Vladimir Arnold, which is a mathematical physicist. Um, it is useful to compile from time to time the lists of sleeping problems in unfashionable domains, just to know that the problems are still open. So. I think logic is is considered quite unfashionable by many, so maybe we have a chance with logic to answer that question. Uh, and here is where logic and logicians enter. So notice that ELO of G is actually a countable Borel equivalence relation. What do I mean by countable? Uh, so countable is about the cardinality of the classes. I mean that every class is countable, not that the equivalence relation is countable. If the space is uncountable, the equivalence relation is always uncountable because it has to contain the diagonal. Uh, but what I mean is that every class is countable. And this is obvious because every class is the orbit of the action of a countable group. All right. And um, we have, uh, we have a, we have a general fact about countable Borel equivalence relation, which is the following. If E is countable Borel, uh, or C bear for short, uh, on a standard Borel space X, then the quotient space is standard with the quotient Borel st structure, even though if the equivalence relation is smooth. And by smooth, I mean that there is a Borel function from the space uh, into the real numbers uh, such that uh, two elements of the space are equivalent, even though if their images are the same. So in other words, this smoothness just tell me um, that we can classify the objects of X up to E using numerical invariants. So here the choice of the real number is completely arbitrary, it can be replaced by any, uh, any, any Polish space. Uh, so for example, we can take a complex number, uh, we can take any Euclidean space and still have the same definition. And the reason why this is true, well, one direction is, is uh, clear because if x mod e is standard, uh, then, then the map uh, sending an element uh, into its equivalence class um, uh, witnesses smoothness, just because I told you that we can replace R by every poly space, actually every uh, standard broad space. Um, the following direction, okay, I don't want to see the details, but it's just an application of losing Novikov and the consequence of losing Novikov theorem uh, that a image of a Borel set through a countable to one function is Borel in the target space. All right, so we have this nice equivalence. Now let's introduce some machinery, at least to uh, say whether an equivalence, a, a countable Borel equivalence relation is smooth or not. So the techniques we're using today is mostly generic ergodicity. Um, so let me give you the, the definition here. An equivalence relation E on a Polish space X is said to be generically ergodic if and only if for every E invariant bare measurable subset of X, that set is either meager or co-meager. So this is just the generical version of uh, ergodicity in the measure theoretical setting. And uh, it basically says that uh, every, um, 
reasonable subset of X, which is the union of E classes, is either very small or very big, where big and small here is, uh, um, is expressed in terms of um, category. All right. Um, but okay, uh, we, we have a better characterization of generic layer PCP. Uh, so if when G is acting on a polish space X continuously, then the following are equivalent. The induced orbit equivalence relation, which uh, in general is denoted by G, so for ELO of G, we have a special notation, but uh, in general we use uh, we use the one that you find find in this slide. Um, so the use orbit equivalence relation is generically ergodic if and only if there is a dense orbit. And sometimes it's much easier to find a dense orbit rather uh, instead of proving ergodicity. And uh, how is this connected to smooth? So we have a proposition saying that if G is a countable group acting on a polished space continuously, um, then uh, if, the, um, if the induced equivalence relation is, generic, is generically ergodic and every orbit is smeager, uh, since G is countable, this, uh, this always happens when X is a perfect space, um, then the induced equivalence relation is not smooth. Uh, so somehow, generic ergodicity with some other mild assumptions is an obstruction to smoothness. But wait a minute. In uh, 2012, Clay and Rivas at the same time, prove that, they, that the conjugacy action on ELO of F2 has a dense orbit. And uh, since we mentioned the theorem of McLary that e, um, LO of F2 is a perfect space, this automatic, automatically gives that ELO of F2 is not smooth. Hence, ELO of F2 modulo F2 is not standard. So it turned out that um, Arnold was right, and formalizing the problem in this unfashionable, in this unfashionable domain already gave the answer to um, the Roy Navas and Rivas question. Now, is this satisfactory enough? Well, if you just uh, want to know the answer of a math question, yes. Uh, but somehow this theorem can show uh, that the quotient structure of display of, of this space uh, is more is more complicated than people believe. So it is worth in, in investigating. So the first uh, theorem of ours uh, is that um, is an algebra obstruction to smoothness. So if G is left orderable but not locally indicable, then ELO of G is not a smooth equivalence relation. Thus, uh, E L of G mod G is non-standard. Uh, and the proof of this theorem, I'm just saying, uh, but if you like, we can uh, we can discuss it later. Uh, uses generic ergodicity, uses um, an order theoretic characterization of local indicability. Um, and relies upon the existence of minimal set uh, for 
uh, continuous action on compact spaces. So somehow there's a hidden application of uh, some choice and uh, in, we appeal to the source lemma. So this is just to uh, be very precise with the logician part uh, to the logic part of the audience. So now I um, want to skip a few slides to continue with the flow uh, because I'm momentarily skipping the proof. But before I do this, are there any questions? Okay. So also, uh, just to continue on this and to explore the structure of the space of left of left orderings, um, somehow we want to go beyond the dichotomy standard no standard and see what's in what's in there. So the very fundamental and natural question is how complicated is really E L O of G for a given group G. Uh, so this is a question about the equivalence relation that, of course, you can rephrase it for the for the quotient space. How complicated is the uh, quotient graph structure? And it turns out again that the Scritti theorist developed a theory of graph classification, which is suitable for analyzing complexity of or of non-smooth equivalence relation, or just to use the words of Edward Efros, classifying being classified. So we can really classify what is there beyond smoothness, beyond smooth equivalence relation. And the relevant notion is the one of Borel reducibility. So when we are given two equivalence relation, E and F, on two standard graph spaces, X and Y respectively, we say that E is Borel reducible to F, and uh, uh, we we use this uh, order symbol uh, with subscript B. If and only if there is a borough map from X to Y, such that two elements in X are the equivalent, if and only if their images are F equivalent. So uh, if you like, Using this notion, we can reformulate smoothness by saying that E is smooth if and only if it is Borel reduce, reducible to uh, the equivalence relation of equality for real numbers or your favorite poly space. All right, are there any questions about this? Oh yeah, maybe I didn't say enough. Why is this notion relevant for us to, to determine the complexity? So you have to think about Borel reduction as saying that uh, whenever E is Borel reducible to F, then E is not more complicated than F. And we say so because uh, if we have a procedure to determine whether two elements in Y are F equivalent, then you can pull back information and tell me whether two, whether any two elements in X are E equivalent. So this is why uh, this is a suitable notion to uh, discuss complexity problems. All right, so um, the notion of smoothness is somehow a notion of minimality among uh, um, Borel equivalence relation. Uh, there's a famous theorem by Silver, which I'm just mentioning here, that every Borel equivalence relation with um, perfectly many classes um, reduces equality over the reals. Um, but there's uh, the opposite notion of universality. So here we are in the realm of countable Borel equivalence relation. And we say that a countable Borel equivalence relation F is universal 
if and only if is maxima with respect to the pre-order of uh, Borel reducibility within this class. So notion, uh, Notice also that by the definition, there is a unique countable, uh, universal countable Borel equivalence relation up to bioreducibility. Because if you, if you add two, then uh, one has to be reducible to, then the first one has to be reducible to the second one by universality of the second one and vice versa. So uh, up to Borel reducibility, we can talk about the uh, countable Borel universal countable Borel equivalence relation. And uh, a first realization of universality um, uh, was found by looking into the uh, shift action. So this is just a definition in symbolic dynamics. If X is a countable set, uh, then we can define the shift action of um, any countable group G on the space uh, of function from G to X, um, which is given essentially by shifting the value of, uh, by shifting every value of the function by an element G. So given, a, given an element of the group little g and given an element in the space P, we can define a new function just by shifting uh, uh, every result by uh, G inverse, by G slots. Okay. So the induced equivalence relation in this action is denoted by uh, E of GX. Here, if you don't like the notation, just complain with other people, not with me. Um, because this was introduced in the original paper on hyperfiniteness uh, in countable Borel equivalence, equivalence relations by Doherty, Jackson, and Kekris. Um, they also analyzed the class of countable Borel equivalence relation at large, and they proved that um, the equivalence relation generated by the shift action of the non abelian uh, free group on two generators on the space, I should point out, on the space to, to DF2 is universal. And this was the first uh, rather natural example of uh, universal countable Borel equivalence relation. Are there any questions? about universality? So we just said universality is maximal complexity. And uh, in the second main theorem that I want to present today, um, we proved that ELO of F2 is also universal, countable Borel equivalence relation. So somehow the the question we found, found in, in the book was very, uh, was very shy. Not only there is a group for which the uh, equivalence relation ELO of G is, uh, is complicated, more complicated than identity over, over the reals, but also it is universal. So this really tells you that uh, the Quotient structure, uh, let, me, let me write here, just to find, this quotient structure, this quotient Borel structure is as complicated as it can be. And uh, uh, first of all, let me say uh, I stated this theorem for F2 because it's somehow uh, more elegant, but there's uh, um, there's nothing about number two. Uh, this theorem can be stated the same way. They reformulated for any n, again, n uh, greater or equal than two or n omega. Okay, so if you have a non-abelian free group, 
um, the conjugacy relation on its left orders is always uh, a universal countable Borel equivalence relation. And also this result extends to a large class of groups that contains F2. Uh, for example, if we take a direct product of uh, a non-abelian free group with uh, some other left order orderable group, what you obtain is still a group whose conjugacy relation on the space of left orders is universal. And the same for free products and also we have some other examples coming from topology, not theory, uh, just some famous group that, uh, that people has considered before in the literature. Um, okay, now uh, I wanna skip again. Okay, are there any questions before discussing further directions and uh, uh, possibly open problems. Okay, so what is the situation now? Uh, uh, why, um, why, at least from my point of view, working in this area um, has been quite exciting? Because there's still a lot to find out. Um, so, first of all, um, we know at the moment only three different outcomes for the complexity of the conjugacy relation EL of G. So we know left order ball group G for which EL of G is smooth. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is always the case if the group is abelian. Um, we have example of group G for which the conjugacy equivalence relation has the same complexity of E0. Uh, so maybe I should say something about E0. Uh, E0 is, is a benchmark in the theory of countable Borel equivalence relation, so it's very important. And it's an equivalence relation which is defined over the over the counter space, uh, we say that X and Y are equivalent according to E0, uh, if and only if uh, there exists an index uh, I such that for every N greater or equal than I, um, the nth value of x is the same as the nth value of y. Uh, let me write this better. So just imagine about the elements of the count. Just imagine the element of the um, counter space as binary infinite strings and uh, E0 is defined by setting two strings equivalent if they eventually agree. All right. And also the third outcome that we mentioned before, we have example of group for which the conjugacy relation on the space of left orders is universal. Just take the non-abelian free groups. So it's very natural to ask, is that all? Well, wait. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute. I have a I have a question here. Uh, is you, you said that like you it's it's not. I mean, maybe it's trivial, but like for some some of these uh, spaces can be also finite, right, or not? Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so if a space is finite. So I mean, if, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's it's trivial, but like you know, for the for the the client bottle or something, you said that uh, already already LO of G is already finite. So yeah. So if uh, so for the for the client bottle, uh, but the client bottle is uh, is in this case. I mean, 
uh, we can define a a reduction into a finite discrete space. So uh, okay, okay. I see. Information is circle is smooth. Yeah. 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 Sorry, uh, sorry. That was that, that that was silly of me. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, that's an uh, that's an excellent observation because how to um, borrow reducibility for but up to broad bioreducibility for cardinality reason, uh, I should separate the the, um, the finite ones for which uh, we only have a, a finite space and therefore also a um, yeah and, and and therefore a finite number of equivalence classes. But yeah, it in this. Uh, in this uh, list, they belong to the first type. So, um, so here we have uh, we have some structure theorem for countable Borel equivalence relation that that tells us that there cannot be anything in between equality over the reals and E zero. Uh, so the question is. Is there some group for which the equivalence relation EL of G has intermediate complexity, namely between a universal one and E0? Or also, um, this is another very natural question. So, all the previous complexity that I mentioned are linearly ordered. So, are uh, um, yeah, are the countable Borel equivalence relation of the form EL of G for some orderable, for some left orderable group G linearly ordered by Borel reducibility? Well, I think that if, if the answer to, sec, uh, to the second question were positive, this would be a very interesting result for group theorists. Because then we can classify left order left orderable groups uh, and their complexity very well in terms of Borel reducibility. Otherwise, a negative answer to the second question uh, it will imply a positive answer to question one. So in this, uh, so I think that this outcome will be very interesting for descriptive set theorists showing that. Uh, we can construct a bunch of examples of equivalence relations of this kind. And uh, yeah, here, uh, this is the structure theorem I, I was mentioning before, uh, known as the general Glimafros dichotomy. Uh, why uh, it's so important to discuss E0? Because E0 is the next minimal object after uh, equality over the reals in our theory. So a countable Borel equivalence relation, but actually the hypothesis of countability can be removed, can be removed, is either smooth or E0 continuously embeds into it, which in particular provides that E0 is Borel reducible. So um, just to say the class of countable Borel equivalence relation has this shape, there is a minimal object quality over over the real, which is a mean. Uh, so it's a minimal. It, it's a minimal object uh, if we look at those equivalence relation uh, with perfectly many classes. I'm not considering equivalence relations with uh, a countable number of classes. And uh, the. The equivalence relation next in line is E0. And then the class is fairly big. There are a bunch of examples, a bunch of equivalence relation. Just let me say that we can find continue many uh, pairwise incomparable countable Borel equivalence relation up to Borel reducibility. So in the middle somehow, we can build many anti-chain of size continuum. So there are really many, many degrees of complexity. 
and we have our uh, universal element on top. All right, um, but beside, uh, but even though there are many equivalence relations that are not Borel reducible to zero, uh, we have the following fact, uh, which was observed first in the paper by Yort and Kekris, saying that for a countable Borel equivalence relation E on a polyspace X, so it doesn't matter its complexity, even in the case it's universal, there is a commeager E invariant Borel subset of the space such that the restriction of E on that set is hyperfinite. So I, don't, I didn't introduce hyperfinite, but this basically means this is equivalent to say is uh, Borel reducible to E zero. So, so this fact is very informative because it tells us that we cannot separate any countable Borel equivalence relation from E zero using only um, um, bare category methods. All right, and uh, to answer the question of uh, equivalence relation EL of G of intermediate co complexity, there's a serious obstruction. So all results of incomparability between countable Borel equivalence relations, okay, maybe not all, but really most of them, um, uses properties of Kashtan group, measure theory, ergodic theory, and the co-cycle reduction theorems. Uh, so these techniques are usually very involved uh, and uh, uh, are on the side of on, on the measure theoretic aspect of the subject. And, um, and this is a serious obstruction for us because we don't know any example of a uh, left-order Volkashna group. In fact, this is still a is still an open question. Becca de Larp and Valet in their book ask if there exists any left order of cash group, and people still don't know. Uh, without talking too much about cash and group, the prototype example of cash and group is SOSL3Z. And this is the group of matrices A, B, C, D uh, with integer values such that the determinant is uh, one. So for else SL3Z, we know that this group is not left order. This is actually a theorem by um, Dave Morris. But, but why SL3 and not SL2? Uh, excellent uh, question, Matteo. Uh, so uh, SL2Z, we know it is certainly not uh, left orderable. Uh, because it contains elements of finite order. Uh, the matrix minus one, uh, sorry, ne negative one, zero, zero, negative one, as finite order, as order two. So this is, this is not left orderable for uh, basic reasons. But, but the SL3Z the definition is, you wrote is SL2Z. Sorry? Two by two. The definition you wrote is SL2Z, it's two by two matrices. So you probably have to put yeah, three right. by three matrices. Um, yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's quite funny. Um, uh, thanks, Gian thanks, Gianluca. Uh, let, me, let me correct this. Uh, GL3. Uh,
I mean, this is a matrix. Uh, three by three uh, with elements in Z uh, such that its determinant is one. Okay. All right. Um, so. Um, so basically, this example, well, they are used a lot to produce incomparable uh, countable Borel equivalence relation, uh, don't work for us. And this is why the problem of finding intermediate Borel equivalence relation of our kind is, uh, is quite hard because uh, we cannot use too many groups that we would use otherwise. So I think it's a hard, interesting problem. Um, moreover, oh, okay, there's, um, in my opinion, there's another interesting direction that it's worth uh, investigating, uh, which is um, the one of approaching an open question by Simon Thomas. Um, so let me give this definition. A countable Borel group G is action universal if there is a standard Borel space X and the Borel action of G on X such that the induced um, countable Borel equivalence relation is universal. Here, here there's a type of countable, doesn't do anything here. Uh, okay. And uh, Simon Thomas asked whether uh, universality is equivalent to the property of containing a non-abelian free subgroup. So is it true that if G is a countable group, the following are equivalent, G action universal, and uh, G contains non-abelian subgroup, if you like, G contains a, a isomorphic copy of F2. So one direction is uh, uh, rather well known. Uh, if G contains a copy of F2, uh, then the equivalence relation generated by the shift action is universal. This is a general fact. And a, a much deeper theorem, the conjugacy uh, equivalence relation uh, here we're looking at different space. On the polyspace of subgroups of G is universal. And this is a very interesting theorem with many applications by Andretta Camerlo and York. Uh, so this is just to say that we have many examples showing that two implies one. It's rather obvious. And um, I think, so now, Unfortunately, our techniques to produce uh, equivalence relation of the kind EL of G uh, that are universal, unfortunately, they only uh, work for groups containing a copy of F2. So with the techniques that we develop in our paper, uh, we don't obtain any information about the previous question by Thomas but it's still too early to call. And uh, many left order, left orderable groups are still poorly understood. In, in particular, what is poorly understood is the space of, of left orderings. And some of them may provide new interesting example of countable variety of relations. So possibly they could bring a new perspective to the question above or other open problems. All right, uh, I'm done with this. So thank you very much for being online. All right. Um, so what we can so the first uh, the first part of uh, Filippo's seminar is uh, is uh, is concluded. Uh, we'll continue. We'll take a short break of like uh, five minutes.
And then we'll continue uh, for those who want to to listen to uh, how the how the proofs of the two the two main theorems uh, that Filippo talked about um, go. So, um, is there any question on uh, on on this part or? I, if I may ask a question, hi Filippo, this is Alberto Marcone. Hi. hi. Uh, the question is uh, maybe I'm just missing something. Uh, if you restrict yourself to bi-orderable groups, yeah. then you have uh, you have uh, what kind of examples can you get in that specific subcase? Let's say. Um, so first of all, um, if you just look at the space of bi-orders, we don't uh, obtain any interesting result. Um, uh, within the, this perspective, because the conjugacy action is the trivial one. Uh, but uh, there are no essential restrictions, because, for example, the, the non abelian free groups on two generators is, 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 is biorderable. There are plenty of biorders, um, and still we get maximal, maximal complexity. Uh, but, so, but in that case, there are also left orders which are not by orders, right? Exactly. That's important. Exactly. Yeah. And the, those are the ones that are really interesting for your conjugacy, conjugacy action, right? Yeah. If you like, we can say something uh, sharper than the statement of our theorem. We can say that the conjugacy equivalence relation restricted on the difference uh, of left orders and uh, by orders uh, is. Um, universal right. because all complexity is there i mean if we're looking sure, at the sure. conjugacy action we cannot get anything complicated if we look at by orders right, uh, but, but this is an excellent question and there's a, a recent development uh on uh, on that side um so uh here i need an empty slide uh, this is mostly empty. Um, so studying this guy, L O of G mod G is uh, uh, basically the same as studying L O of G mod. Um, he, he, here I'm just changing notation. Instead of writing G, I, I, I consider the inner automorphism of G, which is a countable group. So with this notation, it's pretty clear that there's a very natural generalization of uh, this quotient. One can wonder about L O of G modulo uh, the full group of automorph of automorphism of G. Notice that this is not countable in general. So in, in a very general case, we're not in the realm of countable variety equivalence relation anymore. Uh, but for some groups, this is still countable. So in uh, in uh, a subsequent paper with um, that maybe you guys already heard about because you had Seth Shani some time ago, in a subsequent paper with uh, Dave Marker, uh, Luca Motros, and Seth Shani, uh, we proved that um, if we restrict to some special left orders. Uh, of uh, um, was it Z two, which is exactly the um, space of Archimedean orders on Z two. I say left orders or orders because these orders are left invariant, but they're also right invariant because Z two is abelian, so this really doesn't matter. If we look at this space modulo automorphism of G. Um, so we can show that the equivalence relation induced by OG on the space um, is not smooth. So there is some complexity to analyze, even uh, for, for space of by orders. But of course, we need to move to some coarser relation. For example, this one. Right. Um, is if there is uh, if there is there is no more question on the first uh, part, 
then uh, maybe we should take a five minute break. And, uh, we resume at uh, at ten to six for questions concerning the for the demonstrations of the of Filippo's uh, uh, results. Should uh, we should start again? It's uh, ten to six. So, Filippo, I I I don't really know what uh, what you want to present, uh, either the first or the or the second uh, of your of the results that you exposed before. But uh, um, you're free to yeah. go. So, uh, first of all, uh, maybe. Uh, 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 one sec. Almost there. Uh, I think I want to restore or discard it. Just restore. It. All right. So I was thinking about possibly presenting the first pro, the first proof, because for some reason um, uh, it, it's been more overlooked, and every time I I talk about this theorem. Well, first of all, I have less than one hour. I say something about the second proof, but I don't say absolutely anything about the first proof. Um, but first, since I guess we have time, I'd like to hear if there are uh, more questions. Maybe uh, somebody wanna wanted to ask uh, before. Questions yes. or curiosities are, are welcome or observations. No, not so far, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, let me find the proof. All right, so first of all, there's something to say. Um, I, didn't, I didn't present many examples of this. So as I said before, um, G, um, so when G is, is a non-abelian Free group G is biorderable. It is known. It is local indicable. Uh, so uh, doesn't it is not included in this definition. The fact that the conjugacy action uh, generates a, no, a non-smooth equivalence relation. Uh, but we have some examples. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. Yes. Can you can you just uh, briefly remind me what's locally indicable? Okay. So um, G is local indicable. So of course one one can define indicability separately, uh, but uh, local indicability is the property of indicability for finitely generated sub subgroups, as uh, as usual in group theorem. Um, so G is local indicable if and only if every finitely uh, generated H uh, in G uh, admits a surjection over the integers. So every we have that is a subtraction map H onto Z. So this is the notion of local indicability. Um, there are, uh, so I didn't say that, uh, uh, but uh, we have the following situation. Um, we have the buyer durability, this is this is a theorem. is not so obvious. Um, Biodurability implies um, local indicability, which implies uh, left or durability, and none of these implication reverses. And if you're curious about the, the notion of local indicability, it was introduced by Higman 
in the 50s uh, to study some property of uh, unit groups in uh, in uh, in in um, certain rings. So it just happened to be very closely related to uh, the theory of left orders, but has separate motivations for that. And uh, there are some examples of groups that are left orderable, but not locally indicable. Some famous ones are these braid groups. Okay, I'm just giving a presentation here. Uh, I'm not saying that much. Let, besides the fact that there are groups that are could be interesting for topologies, um, uh, they are motivated in not theory. But also, I, I, I'm not an expert about this, so I can just give you the, the example. And, and, and these break groups defined as follows for n greater than fine happen to be uh, not locally indicable, therefore, to satisfy the proof of our theorem. And there are more examples from a fundamental group of surfaces. Uh, all right. So, at least the statement is 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 now. You know, it's not vacuous. All right. Uh, so, uh, as I'm mentioning here, we use uh, it's not a difficult to prove, but we combine um, various facts. We combine the um, generic ergodic ergodicity as an obstruction to smoothness. We combine uh, or an order theoretic characterization of local indicability. And uh, um, we use the existence of minimal sets. And uh, here, there's the application of Zorn's lemma. So um, here, uh, we work with very general assumption. If G is a group, it's usually a topological group, but in our case, it's always countable. So we can think about just a group with a discrete topology. Uh, G acts on X continuously and uh, X uh, is a compact point space. Then we can define uh, this set, uh, the set of uh, non empty, closed, and uh, G invariant uh, subset of our space. Um, this set is obviously non empty because the space itself is, is uh, closed, non empty, and G invariant. Um, and is naturally ordered by inclusion. So, um, when G, uh, sorry, when X is compact, um, and we have a chain uh, whose elements are in S, um, this chain has no empty intersection. So this is a general fact about uh, compact spaces. It follows from the definition that um, uh, whenever, um, so it, it follows from the fact, for just the simple fact that ev every chain satisfies the finite intersection property. And in compact space, every such set uh, admits non-empty intersection. So this, Really nothing deep besides an application of compactness. And this is the standard argument that combined with Zor's lemma. So this tells us that uh, every chain is bounded from below. Uh, by applying the Zor's lemma, we can conclude that there is a minimal element for this partial order. And we call this, uh, it's usually called minimal set, uh, I was discussing before with Gianluca, he, he studies G flows. Uh, I think in this context are called minimal flows. Uh, we, we just call it the minima invariant set, a minimal invariant set for the action of G. Okay. And its existence follows from Zorn's lemma. All right, there are a few facts to keep in mind about, about this guy. Um, if I remember well, the following two statements are equivalent. So, uh, if a subset of M that we obtained with the previous 
procedure is minimal for the action, then we have the following two statements. Uh, whenever C subset of X is closed and G invariant, and its intersection with M is non-empty, then M is contained in X. This is minimality. Um, but also for... I guess you mean in C. M is contained in C, right? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, this is certainly vacuous. I mean, this is obvious. Uh, this is typo, so this is C. This is minimality. Yeah. Thanks, Alberto. Um, and uh, uh, the other property is that for all element in X, the closure of the orbit of X is dense in M. Okay. All right. So, uh, so at the basis of this theorem, there's the following proposition that. Uh, so I have to admit when uh, um, when uh, on an early on an early draft of, of this paper when we started working about this I was rather skeptical, um, uh, but basically this is what we can say. Suppose that G is a countable group acting on a compact polyspace X continuously, and suppose that E. Gx, which is the induced equivalent rotation by the action, is smooth, then there exists a finite orbit. All right. So let's see, let's see a proof of this proposition, which we use as a lemma. Uh, again, sorry, there might be some typos. Uh, so suppose that uh, um, Suppose that uh, here, sorry, but the notation is messed up. EGX. So suppose that EGX is smooth, as in the hypothesis, uh, and uh, let M be a minimal set for the action. Uh, we already said that this exists by an application of the Zorn's lemma. Uh, so since EGX is smoothness, is smooth, um, we can also conclude. Uh, smooth smoothness for here. Sorry, but there's another typo for the equivalence relation generated by the action of G on M. This is because M is an invariant set contained uh, in uh, in X. Um, and uh, but in M we have additional information by uh, minimality. Um, we can say that the G orbit of every point is dense. So let's let's see how we can use this fact. So we have an equivalence relation uh, which is defined on a on a compact polish space for which the orbit of every point is dense. We know that the equivalence relation is um, is smooth. Hence, by contraposition um, to the proposition of the ob obstruction for smoothness, we must conclude that there is an orbit which is non meager. So we mentioned we mentioned before during the slides. Uh, so how was it that if if there is a uh, dense orbit and this is just the property of generic ergodicity uh, plus uh, every orbit is no meager then we can conclude E, G, X, not smooth. So here we just use the converse in order to conclude that there must be a non-meager orbit. 
Okay, however, uh, we can certainly write this orbit as the union of singlet because the orbit is countable. It's a countable union of singlet. Um, so, therefore, uh, so in case uh, there are no isolated, there are no isolated points in the space, and among this, uh, this would uh, imply that this orbit is meager, and we cannot be. So there must be a point in the orbit that is not isolated. In other terms, there's some g g naught in G such that g naught acts on x naught is open in M. So this is the isolated point we are considering. But again, we said before that every orbit in this space is dense. So every orbit must have non-empty intersection with uh, um, with this guy, with this singleton, which means that G naught acts on X naught uh, must be included in every orbit. But since orbits are disjoint, this is only possible in the case M consists of a single orbit. So M is exactly the orbit of X naught. So I don't understand why why you decompose G the orbit of X zero as a union of of open sets. I mean, no. Why, uh, I mean, well, this this orbit is not open. So you are saying. So if if this guy are are um, so if these guys are. Um, Let me say. Let me say in this way. If 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 these guys are not open, so if if all uh, these are not open, uh, then the singleton is nowhere dense. Therefore, um, the orbit is written as a countable union of nowhere than set. So the orbit is meager. Okay. I should say for all G and G. But this is not possible because we said before that this orbit is non meager. So at least one of them must be open. Okay. Uh, so, since every orbit is dense, we concluded that M must consist of a single orbit, because every orbit of M must contain uh, G naught axon X naught. But wait a second, M uh, then is countable and is also closed. So, since M is a closed um, a subspace of X, M is a compact space with the relative topology. And uh, we can also say that not only this singleton is open, but uh, for every point in the same orbit, the singleton will be open because it's the image to a continuous function since the action is continuous. I don't know if this is clear, but if we have uh, G's G, G1 acts on X naught is the same as G1, G0 inverse of G0 X naught. Uh, so this is to say that singleton uh, this guy is a is a pre-image through a continuous function of this guy. And since this is open, this has to be open. So this follows from the continuity of the action. 
so again, M is a compact space with a relative topology, is countable. Every point in M is isolated. So every point is an open set. So now if M is infinite, there is an open covering of M consisting of infinitely many open sets, the singleton that doesn't have any finite subcovering. So M must be finite. Which also gives that the orbit of X naught is finite. So how did I go here? Was it was it clear enough? Yes, yes. It was clear for me. Yeah, yeah. So um I have to I I have to give much credit of this uh, proposition to my author. Uh, he he observed that, and uh, and uh, when uh, when he pointed that out to me, I couldn't believe it because uh, I mean it's it's a very basic use of ergodicity and uh, uh, some property of of, uh, of group section, uh, but I have to say I couldn't find this proposition elsewhere. So. I mean, still hard to say for me if it's folklore or or was something really unknown before. In general, it would be interesting to see more applications of this of this proposition. The only application I know is uh, uh, within our context. Wait a minute, uh, Filippo. Yeah. The, do you have, do you have do you have example like can it be of any of any finite cardinality or? Do you have exa examples in mind, or is it, is it just an abstract uh, thing that you noticed? Um, well, uh, for the for the trivial action, uh, that's certainly a smooth uh, equivalence relation generated by um, uh, so equivalence relation generated by the trivial action certainly uh, satisfies the requirement of of this theorem every orbit is finite because it's just a singleton yeah yeah uh, but then it's just a singleton so yeah uh i have to say i don't i don't have much example i think one could uh, build something artificially uh, all right no, thank you And uh, then, um, uh, as I said before, the second ingredient of our theorem is an order is an order theoretic characterization of the algebraic property of local indicability. Local indicability. Here, we're going to use this as a black box. So let me first define what I mean by Corradian ordering. If a left ordering on a group G is correct, so sorry, a left ordering on a group G is corradian if and only if for every pair of positive element uh, G and H, G, there exists a natural number such that, uh, sorry, G is less than uh, H times um, G, G to the N. So if you just look about the definition, this is a sort of uh, Archimedean type property for um, known by orders. Um, this should somehow remind you of the Archimedean type property. Let me also point out that um, if we have an an ordering on G, which is invariant both sides, so that is a by order, um, we can certainly conclude that that order is corradian, uh, because certainly if uh, G and H are positive, then certainly also H uh, 
let me take a suitable power of g. Uh, h times g n minus 1 is also positive. Uh, then here I use uh, right invariance to obtain g less than h times g. And, uh, and the black box we're using is the, this theorem by Brodsky that g has a corradian left order if and only if g is locally indicable. Okay, so the proof of our theorem is uh, mixing this ingredient all together. There's really uh, nothing else deep. Uh, so if g is left orderable but not locally indicable, um, then we claim that ELO uh, of g is not smooth. Has the quotient space is not standard. So here is the proof. Uh, we show the converse, in fact. We show that if E L of G is smooth, then G admits a Corradian left order. And guess what? The Corradian left order is the one with finite orbit. So I already spoiled it, uh, but let's go step by step. So suppose that E L of G is smooth. Uh, since E L of G is generated by the continuous conjugacy action, uh, uh, we can apply the, the, the proposition before. So there is a left order on G. Here I'm using the notation of the positive cones because it is somehow uh, more elegant. Um, so we, ha we have a left order on G P uh, with a finite orbit. So since the orbit is finite, even any g in P, um, necessarily there is uh, n. So since g is positive, the group is torsion-free, the all powers of, of g are positive and different. So this is also important. It's also important to keep in mind. Since the orbit the conjugacy orbit is finite, there is a natural number n such that uh, g to uh, the negative, so g to the n inverse um, pgn is the same as p. Okay, so this is just because we cannot find uh, infinite different orders in the orbit. So this implies that um, for every h, which is in p, if we take the conjugates of a, this is also in, in p. Here, I'm just using the inclusion part of this equality. So, but what does it mean? Uh, just remind that P is not just a set. P is a positive cone. So P is a cone of positive element of some, uh, of some ordering. So we can rephrase this in terms, of, uh, in terms of the order. So we obtain that the left ordering associated to P, uh, here I should write P equals P less than, with the, with the notation that we introduced before, uh, satisfies the following inequality. Gn is less than h to the gn. And again, uh, since g is a positive element for the ordering, because we took g in p, uh, this must hold. And again, since g and h were were chosen arbitrarily in the positive cone for the order, so were chosen as arbitrary positive elements, uh, we can conclude that P satisfies the property uh, of uh, correct, satisfies the Corradian type property. So there is a Corradian order, and therefore uh, we use our black, black box in order to conclude uh, that um, G is locally indicable. 
can, can you can you explain better the equality g minus n p g n equals p i don't i don't understand why this n must, must exist yeah yeah okay okay uh, so again i'll get i'll get some uh, some free space so um Our orbit is an orbit for the conjugacy action. So what do, do we find inside this guy? Um, so inside this guy, we find uh, elements of the kind, uh, here I'm not using little g, I'm using another letters, of the kind f, p, f inverse with f in g. This is just our definition with this set being um, this is f little p f inverse with p in uppercase p. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we know that this is finite. So this is finite. Let me delete this to get some space. So if this is finite. In particular, uh, if we take uh, a specific G in G, so this is a fixed element of the group, which is positive. This set, um, uh, G to the... Uh, I think I use inverse. Yeah. G minus n inverse uh, p g n with n n is finite mm -hmm. because it it's contained here. Okay, so uh, certainly we can find. Uh, uh, so here the trick is just uh, it just group theoretical. Um, um, sorry, let me gain more. I just don't have enough space. Uh, so there are an an n different. Actually, let me take l and n different such that. Uh, G L inverse P G L uh, is the same as G M inverse P G L. Okay, but then uh, we can simplify. If L is uh, less than M, uh, what do we get? Uh, so we get that P here I'm multiplying. Um, yes, okay, to the minus L. In here, yeah. Here we can simplify and get P equals uh, G M minus L inverse P G M minus L, uh, M minus L without the inverse. And we, we just set N as M minus L. Okay, so so it's a it it it's just a computation that follows from uh, mm -hmm. the fact that the orbit is finite, and uh, but let me go back to the top proof in case there are more questions. Let me stress that p is the positive cone of less than. Okay, so this, I think, yeah, as I said before, this proof is not uh, very difficult, but it combines these uh, different aspects that are covered by this subject. Uh, this is why I, I find it worth going, going through it in this seminar. All right, well, uh, thank you. Uh, I guess we are uh, 
approaching the end of the of the seminar so maybe we have like five minutes in the last five minutes we can we can go through some questions for philip for filippo if there are some questions all right otherwise let's just uh, all thank filippo a lot and um thank and, you and uh we <laughs> And uh, we resume uh, next uh, next week. Uh, let me just uh, look at the at the program. Um, so next week we have uh, um, someone named Freund uh, from Darmstadt who's going to talk about Ackermann, Gutstein, and infinite sets. Okay.